What's up everyone, Kaiju no Kami here, and today it is time I finally tackle the most super season of Sailor Moon S. The ending to Sailor Moon R saw the Sailor Guardians defeat the Black Moon Clan with Chibi Usa going back home to the future. No, wait, I'm sorry. Let me start over. The ending to Sailor Moon R featured a clip show that previewed a new threat that was going to be coming into the next season along with recapping events that had happened beforehand. This episode also hinted at a couple of new Sailor Guardians that would be entering the fray, those of whom would become known as Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune. Being that this is the third season of the series, the show was going to have to make some drastic changes to keep the audience engaged. Does it do just that? Or is this show simply no different than Sailor Moon and Sailor Moon R? Let's kick this review off by taking a look at Sailor Moon S's heroes and find out. The Heroes Before I get into the new heroes, I need to first cover what's new with the original cast. We have Usagi Sakino for boyfriend Mamoru Chiba, Ami Muzuno, Rei Hino, Okoto Kino, and Minako Aino. In this season, our favorite girls are studying to take their high school entrance exams while having to save the world from a new threat. Not much has changed between our main guardians who aren't named Usagi, as we already know them through and through. Regardless, that doesn't mean they can't bring us some exciting moments, such as the time Minako got upset for everyone else getting attacked by the villains but her. I'm happy for you, Minako. Let's put it back now. And we also get another great moment from Minako when she has to pretend she is Sailor Moon. You steal an innocent girl's pure heart, and as if that weren't enough, you then mistake her for me. I'm offended by your stupidity. Harkening back to the manga's original concept of her being a Kagamusha. You're Sailor Moon? Mamoru does have a lot more scenes, though sometimes it feels like the writers didn't know what to do with him, so he pretty much stays in status quo mode. Ready? <sighs> Stay clear, everyone! Did Tuxedo Mask just make things much Venus, worse? Get down! He does have this great line when one of the monsters is an orange rose. How dare you use my trademark rose attack! And they can't be orange! Ridiculous! This is also the episode where we meet a friend of Mamoru's who grows roses, which explains how Mamoru can always have an infinite number of roses when he's Tuxedo Mask. Hey, if it isn't Mamoru! Katsumi, hi! How have you been? As usual, you're with some lovely ladies. Oh, and his friend has a lot of kids. Oh? Hi, Daddy! <laughs> I'm gonna guess it's Croquette. Hey, you're right! <laughs> <laughs> Even down to his wife being pregnant. Papa, are you really alright? I'm fine, believe me. Holy crap, they're like rabbits. Moving back to Usagi, she's a little more mature this season. There's this subject I want you to teach me. Like what? Generic, well, I mean, genetic engineering. Though she still has her moments of selfishness. Do you remember, I don't know, ever mentioning to him that your birthday was on June 30th? Not real sure, but if you're in love, you'd be so in tune with the other person, you just know something like that. She does acquire a new transformation sequence and weapon, the Spyro Heart Moon Rod. Moon Spyro Heart Attack! Halfway through the series, she acquires a new item known as the Holy Grail, which gives her a secondary form, deeming herself Super Sailor Moon. Through this upgrade, her rod also gains a new final attack. Taste the rainbow. Another thing that occurs a quarter of the way through the show is the return of Chibi Usa, who is now a Sailor Guardian in training. I am the pretty guardian in training who fights for love and for justice! I am Sailor Chibi Moon! And in the name of the future moon, I'll punish you! Thus, she comes equipped with her own transformation brooch and her own moon rod, which brings in some great hilarity. Huh? I... I did it! <laughs> 
I ended up liking Chibi Usa a lot more this season than the last because she actually did more than just be a spoiled, pampered brat. She adds in some new chemistry into the show along with some great comedy bits that come from her, especially in regarding her mother. It looks like a child wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, she's right. Is he there? Oh my gosh, her participle's dangling. I think part of this is in Hebrew. She spelled daughter with a Q. Sailor Pluto also returns in the middle of the season, this time taking up the persona of a woman named Setsuna Mayo. Scream. Though her role is a dwarfed one. Oh my god. Unfortunately, Usagi's parents never show up in this season, and as far as I can remember, Umino and Naru only appear in one episode. Need to relax. Fall asleep quickly, okay? One sheep. Bah. Two sheep. Bah, bah. Oh, come on. Why can't I fall asleep? <laughs> it's a little sad how characters that were quite vital to the series early on are now being pushed to the wayside. I guess that is just the nature of the bees considering how new characters are necessary to keep things fresh. Nevertheless, it wouldn't have killed them to have had Usagi's parents do something at least once. Anyway, it is time to talk about our three new characters. Haruka Tenno, Sailor Uranus, Michiru Kayo, Sailor Neptune, and Hotaru Tomoe, aka Sailor Saturn. Haruka is an androgynous looking girl who is often mistaken for being a boy. Michiru, is Haruka your boyfriend? We're looking for a yes or no answer! Then it's no. <gasps> Alright, gorgeous lover boy is mine! Oh, Ray, I lost her. I can't compete! Not with a man like that! She is a race car driver and loves to tease Usagi the way Mamoru used to, just not in a mean-spirited way. Her girlfriend, Mishiru, is an artist and violinist who wants to make it big when she gets older. To their disdain, they find themselves being Sailor Guardians who have awakened too late. Our role was to defend the Silver Millennium from threats coming from outside the solar system. But by the time we awakened in this era, the enemy had already established a strong foothold on this planet. Adding to their lament is the fact that they need to hunt down three talismans that are supposed to be hidden in the hearts of three individuals in order to find the Messiah. <laughs> Finding these talismans also means the death of those individuals, which forces the duo to try to detach themselves from friendships that could jeopardize their mission. This will often lead them into conflicts with the other guardians who are there to save everyone because it is the right thing to do. I'm not gonna just let you walk away. I'm gonna kick your butts! Uranus and Neptune really add a new layer to the series as it shows that not all Sailor Guardians are willing to play by the rules. In fact, they are essentially the equivalent to the Six Rangers in Sentai. They show up when needed, cause a rift among their fellow guardians, and kick all kinds of ass. I also love Uranus's world-shaking attack animation. World shaking! Of course, the downside of them taking up so much screen time in the show is that they are the reason the original four Guardians get gypped in development. So, if you are not a fan of these two, and would rather have more screen time given to the original quartet, then you are going to be sorely disappointed. Personally, I am glad Toei decided to put more focus on the new characters over the old ones since we already had those characters for 70 plus episodes. There's no use crying over spoiled milk! I also want to mention that this duo are voiced by some excellent voice actors on both sides of the ocean. For the Japanese track, Megumi Ogata and Masako Katsuki voice the duo. You will most likely recognize Ogata as the voice of Shinji Ikari in Evangelion, along with Yugi in the Season 0 Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, and Niegi in Danganronpa. Ogata is also the Japanese dub voice for Billy Batson in the recent Shazam movie. Katsuki has been known as Rokoa in Zeta Gundam, Tsunade in Naruto, and Nijure Yellow in Mega Ranger. As for their English counterparts, the great Erica Mendez and Lauren Landa voiced them. I'm surprised that a girl who looks like she couldn't kill a bug would spend her free time painting these depressing fantasies. Actually, I know a couple of girls at my school who are obsessed with you. From what I've heard, one of them would love to ride in your car with the wind blowing through her hair as you race along the sea. Finally, as I already mentioned, we have one more new character, Sailor Saturn, 
Well, I actually shouldn't bother calling her Sailor Saturn, as Hotaru only takes on that persona for about 40 seconds in the entire show. I want to thank you for trying to protect me. Bye now. That was a bit anticlimactic. I'm not gonna lie. It is one of the anime's biggest failings compared to the manga, which did a lot more with Sailor Saturn. Nevertheless, Hotaru is an intriguing character. Her mother died when she was a baby. Dead parent. How shocking. And during a lab accident, her and her father were the only ones to miraculously survive. <laughs> Hotaru! Hotaru, talk to me! Say something! Hotaru! No, this can't be happening! This caused her to be a sickly girl, so she rarely ever goes out aside from going to school, where she is often bullied by her fellow classmates. It isn't until she befriends Chibi Usa where she starts to believe she can be healthy and normal. Sailor Saturn is my favorite guardian of the entire franchise, so while it was great to see her get a lot of development as Hotaru, I really wanted to see her kick ass as Saturn. As is, being able to talk more about Saturn will have to wait until I cover the crystal version of this story. There is more I would also like to say about Hotaru, yet it would require massive story spoilers and just talking about her this much has already provided enough minor ones. Hotaru's voice actors are Christine Marie Cabanos and Yuka Minaguchi. Minaguchi is also Videl and Pan in Dragon Ball. Actually, it's more of a thank you letter. I've been sick most of my life, but the fact that he overcame his sickness to become an athlete has inspired me to face my own health problems. The villains. This season's villains are a group of beings from another dimension known as the Deathbusters. Their commander is simply known as the Professor. He's an odd fellow who creates the monsters of the week known as demons. We are now ready to proceed. While Demand is my favorite Sailor Moon villain, the Professor is probably the most fun as he knows how to enjoy being evil as we see in scenes like these. What sport do you especially enjoy, Professor? Rhythmic gymnastics. <sighs> Hello, Udio? Chin Chin Te, can I take your ramen order? Are you sure this isn't Udio? No, Chin Chin Te! In that case, I'll have to show you marinated buttercorn miso ramen with extra pork. <clears throat> <laughs> I love this game, but I can't feel my legs anymore. <laughs> A little help, please. Like with Saturn, to speak about anything more on him would dive into spoiler territory, and I don't want to do that. Spoilers. Spoilers? What spoilers? The professor's assistant is a woman named Keolo Knight. Keolo Knight begins the show by finding someone with a pure heart and infecting something they love with an egg that transforms into a monster upon touch. <laughs> After several failures, she starts to supervise her demons, often finding herself outmatched by the Sailor Guardians no matter what she tries. You weren't listening when I said there was nowhere to run. Usako! Look at me when you fight me! It's rude to ignore your opponent! After a while, she is replaced by a group of students known as the Witches Five. The first of these students to take center stage is a girl named Yudio. Yudio is easily my favorite of the villains as she foregoes the stealthy build-up approach that Keola Knight would spend time doing and goes right for the attack. Gotcha! Shot through the heart and you're too late. It's great as it is like she says, the toku rules of waiting be damned. I want the pure hearts now! Whereas Kaola Knight would also just teleport around Japan to find what she needed, Yudio drives a car that emerges from various points of the country. What the world? Uh, wh what was that? When she fails or gets annoyed, she just drives away. Okay, I'm backing out. Take care of the rest, Chokoka. It's quite hilarious. What's even more badass is that she builds herself a flamethrower to take on Sailor Moon's attacks. Oh, and I love this scene where she fakes playing an organ. <laughs> you fell for it. She also reveals that despite being evil, the Deathbusters do get holidays.
Luckily, today is a holiday. If I find a talisman with my new computer program before the break is over, I'll remain in the professor's good graces. Scorpio! He'll sting you with his dreams of power and wealth. He'll welcome you into his lair. With free dental care and a stock plan that helps you invest. The second member of the Witches 5 to take over is the idol loving Mamet. While Yudio would use computer calculations to pick her targets for those she figured had pure hearts, Mamet, on the other hand, just picks the idol she is in love with that week to be her victim. Before I remove your pure heart and kill you, you have to try these cakes I made! Yes, I could. It's actually quite scary how realistic her actions can be as she will make comments about how killing them will preserve their beauty and stuff like that. Remember kids, a stalker's when two people go for a romantic walk, but only one of them knows about it. Emma might as well just be that, a stalker. She is insanely hysterical though. Once I steal your pure heart, this movie will never get finished. But your final performance will not be forgotten. I pledge to keep your last moments locked in my mind for eternity. Regrettably, the other three members of the Witches 5, Talu, Velui, and Ciprin, only get an episode to themselves as they come off as being nothing more than Monsters of the Week as they were in the manga. It's a little disheartening. I'm not sure if Toei did this on purpose because there wasn't enough they could do to distinguish them from being any different than the other girls, or if it was because they ran out of time and had to quickly wrap up the Witches 5 plot. If it is the latter, then that is quite quite disappointing as they should have made sure the writers were pacing the show much better in order to accommodate the entire group like they had done with the Black Moon Clan. There are two more villains in this season, the main leader known as Pharaoh 90 who is relegated to having nothing more than a television screen appearance in this version. That's just dumb. The other is Mistress 9. Mistress 9 is quite awesome as she is insane, has an uncontrollable length of hair, and uh, well, I can't go into it again due to spoilers. Although. Oh, in this adaptation, she does seem to spend more time talking about her plan rather than implementing it. Which is also a letdown. You have no chance of winning now that I have the Holy Grail, which is a power source of raw emotion. Love, hatred, hope, and fear, packing enough energy to wipe out the entire planet. It's the next step of your master plan. Only a pure heart stronger than the Holy Grail can defeat Pharaoh 90. Translation, boring. <laughs> As I already mentioned, the monsters of the week are called daemons. Initially, they take the form from an object their host treasures. This in turn leads to some really, um, interesting daemon designs. <laughs> Scar! Is that really appropriate for a kid's show? And that's... Yeah, baby! <laughs> and that one? Mikuji! And that one? Stop it! Uh, never mind. After Keola and I is removed from the picture, the monsters are cooked in an easy bake oven using whatever object the professor felt related to the witch's plot. Which can lead to a hilarious moment like when the professor is trying to stick a door into the oven. Well, I'd like to see them try. I'm creating a special daemon to prevent them from interfering with us ever again. Let's see if we can handle this. <laughs> Every rose has its thorn. The animation and music. Everything remains pretty on par with the last two seasons. The opening theme remains unchanged while there are technically two ending themes to this show. Ultimate no Policy carries over from the previous season before it is replaced a few episodes in by Akiko Kusaka's Tuxedo Mirage. This song sung by the five lead actresses is okay. It's neither groundbreaking or terrible, just about average as far as an ending theme goes. The rest of the show's score is pretty par for the course with a couple of great new tracks included. Effect. 
she put such a powerful shield around herself that our usual attacks can't even penetrate it. I do wish by episode 100 that we had got a completely new package of music to go with the show, but it doesn't detract from it regardless given how good it was in the first place. And that's just Toei being Toei. I mean, we're like 890 episodes into One Piece and it still has the same music going on that I had back in season one. Sadly, there is no huge exciting final battle theme this time around, as there really isn't a huge exciting final battle to be had. Like I said, this whole finale aspect is the show's biggest failure. The animation continues to be more of the same, with lifeless background crowds who never blink, static buildings, and odd airs with overly large hands and eyes. Rain also seems to be extremely excessive every now and then to the point where it can be distracting to some. She's with a woman. That's right. And who was it that was so sure she was on a date? Well, the truth is you never know. It could easily still be a date. With that said, that does not mean this season does not have its moments of outstanding animation as there are exceptional scenes and episodes. One episode around the halfway mark of the show has our guardians battling Udio inside of a floating cathedral. Which sounds downright awesome. Why don't we have those in the real world? Anyway, as I was saying, the Guardians and Udio are inside of a floating cathedral where everything is darkened, so we get some really incredible looking use of shadows and animation in the dark that looks extremely detailed. Sorry, everybody! It may be the best the animation has ever looked at this point. Of course, the attack and transformation animations are going to be the highlight, but we also get some good battle scenes that aren't just relegated to still shots. The animation can only get better from here, right? The episodes. Sailor Moon S does a lot to break the formulaic Sentai mode it set itself in. We simply won't allow it. The world knows of your evil. We are the guardians of justice. In the name of the moon, we'll punish you. That's my line. Ugh. Sometimes you will get episodes that have little to no battles with a monster in them. Such is the case when Hotaru and Chibi Usa get stuck in what appears to be the Twilight Zone, and the heroes all have to play a game to get out. If you can beat me in a game of chance, I'll return you to your normal world. <gasps> the Joker! <laughs> yeah, she fell for it! Then you may have episodes where only Usagi and the Outer Guardians may fight. Even the ending to the season does something you didn't expect. This show does a lot to try new things, which is why my favorite episode of the season is Making New Friends, Chibi Moon's Adventure. In this episode, Chibi Usa sits in on a tea ceremony and wants to make friends with the boy who performs the ceremony. In the meantime, Yurio comes up with a plot to steal the boy's heart and we get a hilarious scene from the professor as he is making his monster. Ah yes, tea is wonderful. It soothes the soul. Too hot! Damn it! When Yudio first attacks the boy, Chibi Usa is on her way to save the day and trips on a rock mid transformation. <laughs> Afterwards, she confronts Yudio and we get this scene. I am a pretty guardian trainee who fights for love and for oh, justice! Dear Lord. Damon! Show yourself! <laughs> That's right, Yudio wasn't even paying attention to Chibi Usa's speech and asks her to repeat it. And in the name of the future moon, I'll punish you! What was that? I said, in the name of the future moon, I'll punish you! The monster is unleashed, leading to this side-splitting scene. Ah, that was good. Oh, I almost forgot that earlier a boy decided to flash Chibi Usa. Look at this! <laughs> this is my true nature! I'm an elephant! So when the monster starts to address itself, everyone panics. I think you'll be surprised by what I have to offer. Ugh, 
finish her, Sailor Moon! Oh. Right! This episode was just a lot of fun all around and had my lips smiling the entire time. What took you so long? Hey! You ran ahead without me! What was I supposed to do? Don't blame me! You're a klutz! <laughs> Now, this is the amazing thing about this season. Despite feeling a little let down by the lack of a grandiose finale, it is full of so much character development, new concepts and ideas, and an ever-changing formula that in the long run, the nitpicks are irrelevant. Quite minute even. There is only one episode in the entire season I actually despise, and that was I Love Idols, Mamet's Dilemma. One of the stars Mamet loves is having a contest to determine which of his fans will become his co-star in an upcoming movie. Both Mamet and Monaco partake in this contest, but Mamet is torn at what she should do, kill the idol or become his co-star. It does have some funny moments in it. Jean is going to die! Duh! Of course he is! We're called Death Busters! We're an evil organization! Especially when Monaco and Mamet first run into each other and it plays with your expectations. Huh? No way! This is unbelievable! But other than that, the episode is pretty generic and dumb, even by Sailor Moon standards. It's also a tad boring and isn't helped by the fact you know neither one of them are going to win. The daemon isn't even all that interesting either. My killer song! <laughs> I seem to have forgotten the lyrics. Unbelievable! The movie. Like with R, as head of theatrical filming, goddamn do I wish the animation of the series matched that of the movies. The animation that is found in the movies is just outstanding with excellent looking battle scenes, the use of light and shadows is top notch, and the characters always look consistent whereas in the TV versions their models may change from scene to scene, especially if stock animation is used. Here you have none of that. It is all excellent. Oh, wait. I should be talking about the movie itself, not the animation quality. Sorry. The movie, which was originally dubbed as Hearts and Ice in the US, features an ancient ice queen that is coming to take over the earth. You know I have to do it, right? I mean, she is an ice queen. So, yeah, I've got to do it. me with such contempt. It could have been worse. I could have done this. Can you feel it coming? The icy cold of space. You are not sending me to the cooler. What killed the dinosaurs? The ice age. All right, everyone. Chill. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, as I was saying, the movie is based on a manga side story with an ancient ice queen coming to Earth. Luna gets sick and is rescued from being run over by a sickly scientist named Kakaru. She falls in love with him. That's kind of creepy. But I guess it's no worse than Chibi Usa falling in love with her dad. And wishes she could become a human so she could show him that the fabled Princess Kaguya is real to encourage him to get better. I'm not gonna go there, never mind. Obviously, the Guardians have to battle the Queen and her servants. <laughs> Luna takes on a temporary human form. Uh, wait a second. Am I really in space? And Mamoru has a hilariously bad introduction. Or the most badass introduction ever. Ho ho ho! Merry Christmas! And a Happy New Year! It's what you expect from a Sailor Moon movie, and yet, like the season itself, comes off with a lot of character development compacted into its hour-long runtime. The only confusing part I have is how Kakaru's love interest, the astronaut Himeko, manages to go from Japan to America to space and back all within a few hours. It's a mystery we may never know. I have to say that this is without a doubt my favorite of the three movies. In the end, Sailor Moon S may not be absolutely perfect due to its lackluster final battle, but it is without a doubt my favorite of the three seasons. The villains are all fun, the new guardians are top notch, and it has a perfect balance between comedy and drama. Not to mention the character development in this show is just simply astronomical. As such, I am going to give Sailor Moon S an imperfectly solid five guardians in a sailor uniform out of five. If you love the first two seasons, you are definitely gonna relish this one too. Until next time, bye.